Autism has been a rising issue for many years, and now more than ever, it is the most common and reoccurring mental deficiency to date. In fact, it is one of the big three when it comes to mental illnesses as far as the commonality of diagnoses. In the 1960s, one in every 2,500 children were diagnosed with autism. In 2007, one in every 150 children. What is the reason for this startling increase in autism cases? Do we really know the mechanics of autism? What it really is? Why it is so common? Research for autism has only been relevant and consistent for less than 50 years, which as far as medical and scientific research goes, it's relatively modern knowledge. So through these interviews, I hope to find answers to a multitude of theories and questions that still reside to this very day. Our first interview will be that of my own father, who has in-depth experience in dealing with autistic children during the height of its rapid multiplication in the early 1990s. Let's have a look at this. So I guess we should start off with what, from your experience, what you believe autism really is. Um, simply put, it's, um, it's a brain that thinks a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not smart enough, really I don't know of any expertise, to know if it's chemical, if it's electrical, if it's caused by this or that or whatever. Um, the, the bottom line is uh, it's, it's a brain that gathers in information and calculates things in a different way than what we consider normal. Mm -hmm. um, most people who are autistic, the more severe autistic people, have severe uh, issues they have to overcome. Um, but they've broadened the spectrum so wide now that the majority of people who are autistic, really the trouble comes in that they don't fit into the society we created. Um, uh, their senses are a little bit more enhanced, so they hear frequencies we don't. They see things we don't. Uh, uh, their, their sense of, t all, all their senses. Yeah. You know, and, and it varies from each one of them. So I think that that's, uh, 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 imagine if you had to go through a daily life where uh, the noises of a bus that passes you feels like it's going to burst your eardrums or uh, a fluorescent light, which everybody uses. You can actually see the electric beam going back and forth. So for you, it's a strobe light. Imagine if you had to go to school. Yeah. And you're sitting there doing, trying to do your work. And it's just beaming And down. it's a strobe light. Yeah. As opposed to regular light. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's those kind of things. Somebody scoots a chair across the floor. And it'd be the same to you as if someone put a, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard right by your ear. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that's the main thing is that it, they, they just take in information differently and, and they calculate it differently. So other than that, you know, there's some, the more severe people yeah. have real issues. And much like any quote-unquote normal person is individualized, I assume every case is definitely different from everyone else. Yeah, I worked a long time with uh, uh, autism awareness and, uh, uh, you know, with Zachary, mm -hmm. um, with his autism, we were kind of on the... Uh, your mom and I were kind of on the on the cutting edge, uh, where autism became a thing. Yeah. Um, I was so stupid that when the doctor first told us that Zachary was autistic, my first questions were, "Is it hereditary? Did we give it to him?" And number two, "Is it contagious?" Because I did. We don't I, know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Rain Man wasn't even out yet, which is sad because Rain Man became like the template. Of how, what everybody knows about, you know, the movie Rain Man. Yeah. Is the template of, like, so every autistic person must be like that. He's autistic. Oh, my God, it's like Rain Man. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. no. Yeah. Yes, I mean, that, that's one example of somebody. Mm -hmm. um, they each have their own quirks and their own whatever. Um, and I've, I've met a ton of kids who, who are autistic uh, and continue to meet people who are autistic. I have a lot of good friends of mine who are my age that are just now figuring out they're autistic, and always have been, there just wasn't a name for it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so yeah, it's very individualized, and it's very, uh, uh, just like, like you're saying, each yeah. person anyway. 
Uh, they all have common traits. Mm -hmm. You know, they have common tells, but it's at different levels. And uh, personally, I think they've broadened the spectrum so much now. It's too far. Yeah. You, know, you it's like Oprah. You got autism, and you got autism, and you got autism. Yeah. You know, it's like no. Every disturbance now is an autism. Mm -hmm. It's like we've gone too far the other way. We didn't even know about it before. Before you were just mentally retarded. Yeah. And 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 a lot of even mildly autistic people were put in asylums because we just didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Now you know it's now it's so far the other way because equally even. It's funny because the only parallel between then and now, mm -hmm. though I guess nowadays it's somewhat improved, we still have very little information <laughs> about it as a whole. But now the policies in dealing with it has completely changed. I'll tell you a quick funny story about me. Okay, yeah. Um, when Zach was young, they would have these EEP meetings. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you would go into school, and it would be usually like the principal, the special education teacher, uh, a couple specialists, and usually a, 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 you know, a medical professional, you know, mental disorder doctor, yeah. who was the expert on autism. And you would have to go uh, every six months. And it was ridiculous, because at least in Maryland, when we moved to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was so much better. That was one of the reasons we moved here. Mm -hmm. was the school system was so much better uh, uh, way they handled things. In Maryland, it was very political, very, uh, I'll, I'll even say um, manipulative. Um, but you literally would have to go in at the beginning of each school year and prove that your autistic child was still autistic. That's how behind they were. That's how little they knew. Is he still doing this? Yeah, he didn't drink a special serum over summer and was like, wow, I'm all better now. You know, he just didn't wake it's, up. It's not something you get over. Yeah, it's not like you, 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 know, you pull a hammy and you walk it off and you go, okay, it's better. It, so you would actually have to go in and, and have a meeting again to prove that they were still autistic. And these were the experts. Um, so the, the quick story I wanted to tell you is this is this is a God's honest story, and I think uh, uh, I like to tell it because it shows just how little we knew about autism in the early '90s. Um, so we're sitting there, and I, I I've been through a hundred of these meetings. I'm so tired of it, and they're asking the same stupid questions. And I said, fine. And, it's, and you sit on one side of the table, and like six other people. So it's like a congressional hearing. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of intimidating. They all have their binders and notebooks at the time because mm -hmm. nobody had the laptops or computers. Yeah. So they all have their binders open, and they're all staring at you in the suit and ties, and you got to sit there like a stupid parent trying to answer the questions. And they started asking the questions again. And I said, look, here's the deal. He still flaps his hands, and he still spins things, and he still doesn't make good eye contact. And he doesn't talk all that much. He still does all those things. So yes, he's still autistic. But this summer, he's doing something that really is freaking me out. And I can handle all the weird quirks he's doing, but what I can't handle is the levitation. And they sat across me and went, levitation? I said, yeah, he floats like two or three feet above the ground, and then just starts scooting around the room. I said, it freaks me out. I don't know how he's doing it. The expert, the expert, flips his notebook open and starts jotting down notes. So then, then they realize that I'm BSing, and they kind of like a nervous chuckle, like, oh, you're joking, ha, ah, good one, Mr. Hall, good one, Mr. Hall. And was like, ha, ha, ha. I said, I'm dying to know what he wrote in his notes. I would love to know what that guy, what did you write down? Yeah. I was joking that, that my kid levitates because he has autism. This guy was jotting notes. He couldn't open his notebook quick enough. That, and this is the expert. So I, yeah. did he take it back to the lab? I was like, I knew it. Levitation. Yeah. What did he write down? Why did you write down anything? I was kidding. Yeah. That, I think that tells a lot about how mm -hmm. far we've come and, and probably how little we know about autism. Very true. Even, even nowadays. Um, yeah. Because 
I mean, it's 2019 and we still... Um, but yeah, even now, the research for it is still very undecisive and very, I guess, vague to how it was in 2007, which was a major cutoff date, I guess. Um, well, was for, it 2007? Yeah, 2007 for um, basically the giant multiplication, like, surge from the early okay. 90s to, yeah. So, but even to this, from that point in time till now, we know just about the same. So we, it's real still a, just theories. Yeah, I mean, we're getting better. Um, I can tell you this. I, I can tell you this. Well, here's an example of, of how little we know and how it changes. Your mom and I were rather rebellious with how we handled Zachary. Mm -hmm. We had our own theories about autism. And I read everything I could get my hands on. And, and um, you know, the latest, the latest, the latest. And there was some stuff we just disagreed with. Um, and one of the major things we disagreed with was they, uh, which was the method at the time, they pulled together everyone with autism. And they gave you a special educator, and that educator had helpers. And all that's a great plan. But I had done some research, and one of the things that autistic people do is that it's a trait called mimicking. They mimic what they see. They mimic what they see on TV or hear or, you know, whatever. They mimic routines all the time. They're very schedule-oriented. Mm -hmm. if, if every morning for breakfast they, they knock over their milk, if they did that one time and it got a certain reaction, they will do it on purpose every time because it's part of the ritual. And if it's interrupted, they have a negative reaction to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, because that's their routine, yes. and now you're messing up their routine, and they don't know where to go next. Yeah. They don't like change. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, a lot of that comes from this trait called mimicking yeah. that they do. And it occurred to me, if, if they all mimic, if you're keeping them in a class with nothing but autistic kids, then all they'll ever do is mimic other autistic kids. And they won't progress. So progress. your mother and I fought the school to get Zachary mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. We were one of the first parents to mainstream their autistic kid. That was not done. And we had to fight for that. We had to call in lawyers or whatever to fight to have Zachary mainstreamed. And he finally got to be mainstreamed and was assigned a helper. So he still had a helper. We fought for that. That would help him keep up to speed. So yeah. it wouldn't slow the teacher down too much. Yeah. If Zachary fell behind, let's say, in a math class, he didn't get what was going on, the helper could work with him individually as the teacher kept moving the class along at the regular pace. Mm -hmm. And I understood that. But that, that's why we got the helper with him. Um, but we thought it was important that he be among normal kids mm -hmm. his age. Because if you're going to mimic, that's the pattern you want. That's what I'm, you want him picking up the traits, social mm -hmm. traits, Everything. Um, we were we were the first, at least in Maryland, to really fight for that. Yeah. Other parents didn't do it, and <laughs> it cost the school money because they had to hire us individual helper for that kid. So, um, but that's what our tax dollars are for, mm -hmm. and they got a special, they got special funding for special ed. Yeah. That they never spent. The, a lot of the schools keep that money back for a better football field or mm -hmm. something. We fought hard, and that's what that money's supposed to be spent for, so that's what we got to spend for. Mm -hmm. Within three years of doing that, Zachary went back to his original autistic class, <clears throat> where he had kids that were on par with him when he left. In just two or three years, when Zachary came back to visit his friends in that class again, they hadn't budged. They were still exactly where they were when we left, and Zachary had progressed far enough that when we were walking back to the car, Zachary actually turned around to me. He was maybe eight, nine, maybe that, that eight, yeah. age. At eight or nine, he was able to turn around to me and say, what's wrong with them, Dad? Why do they act that way? And I said, because that's what people with autism do. 
And he said, but I'm autistic. I don't act that way. Already, just a couple years away, he could see how much he had gone past where he could recognize the difference. Yeah. Now, everybody mainstreams. Mm -hmm. So where that was, you know, we were almost burned at the stake for being witches for thinking that way. Now everybody does it. Mm -hmm. So that's how little we knew then that we progressed now. And even then, it doesn't always work. Yeah. But at least it worked for us. You know, Zachary is far ahead where, uh, where he could have been and maybe should have been. Um, but here's a kid that went through high school normally. He yeah. went through all the normal classes. He was an A and B student. Went to college, graduated college on the dean's list. You know, has gotten a job, works in society. You know, he's not just uh, somebody you shove in the corner and give a broom to and say good luck. Yeah. You know, he's he's actually a working part of society, and he earned it. You know. Um, is he autistic? Yeah. Does he have weird quirks? You, 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 you know. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. Yeah. He, he, you know, spent some time with him. You know, he's different. Mm -hmm. You know, he's autistic. But look what he's been able to do. And and it's sad because a lot of those kids in that original class with him in grade school, you know, they didn't make it out. You know, they might not have even made it out of high school, outside of special ed. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that they definitely didn't go to college, or maybe they are just pushing a, a broom somewhere. Um, and that's sad. That's mm -hmm. sad. Your, your mom and I were rather rebellious and, and kind of hell raising with it, and, and we we did our homework and we had theories that weren't popular at the time. It's good to see that coming around, but that just shows you, you know, what twenty five years, you know, coming up on thirty years. We really still don't, still don't know. Yeah what we're doing. And it is a shame because, especially from what little that I know about it, I can safely discern that it's something that can be managed and if you work hard enough, like how you did with Zachary at a young age, <coughs> you can see him overcome and get into a better part of society and operation, whereas the children who were neglected, like those kids that he visited when he returned back to that class, don't have any progression. Um, and unfortunately, I'd say it's actually kind of getting worse, because if parenting was in any way kind of detached like that back then, we can only imagine modern children having to deal with a modern parenting culture like we have now. Yeah. Not to sound like the old grandpa on the porch mm -hmm. yelling it off my lawn. Yeah. Uh, your generation has it tough enough just being a normal kid with, with parents the way they are. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a lot more divorce. Uh, uh, there are parents who sometimes have greater issues than the kids. Yeah. You know, it, it could be anything from substance abuse to uh, you know, just not being able to cope well with different things. Um, you know, your generation of, of you guys got it tough. The, the, it's very, uh, parents today are not the way parents were, you know, 20 years ago as hands-on. And even in my, in my time, the majority of parents we knew were already heading in that direction. Yeah, they were they were pretty bad. So my generation wasn't that great either, you know, compared to when I was growing up where you always had a stay-at-home mom and, you know, a dad that did this and, you know, it's far more regimented and uh, now it's it's tough. Mm -hmm. So it's if it's tough for a kid like you, imagine how tough it would be if you had autism on top of it. Yeah. That's, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, there's so many factors in it. I can imagine mm -hmm. that would be difficult. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned before some of the certain quirks or tics that um, <coughs> you find common among autistic children. Right. Um, can you kind of explain like what they do and maybe even why or why you think? Yeah. Um, there's some standard traits that they're all not cookie cutter, you know. Yeah. Um, but. Um, Lack of eye contact, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because they find it intimidating that someone's staring right at them. They have trouble reading uh, people's intentions, people's emotions. Um, I, I know it's it's a horrible thing to say, it's just about as saying Rain Man. But in a lot of ways, um, the Big Bang Theory has summed up medium to mild autism very well with the character Sheldon. Very true, yeah. Sheldon, if you watch Sheldon's quirkiness, a lot of that is autistic. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that they've never come out and said it. Yeah. They just said that Sheldon's different. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is, is pretty standard. Um, again, they don't make eye contact. Um, they have trouble reading things like sarcasm because logically it doesn't make sense. Sarcasm does not make sense. You're saying one thing, but it means something else. But it means else. something else. Yeah. So the words don't match the meaning. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. They're very logical people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's a trouble. They have trouble showing different emotions. Um, they can come off robotic at times. I know that in Zachary's case, uh, he was pretty typical at the time. I don't know if it's still the standard. Um, but Zachary didn't speak till after he was four years old. Uh, usually kids speak much earlier yes. than that. Um, he didn't. He didn't speak. When he went to uh, kindergarten, uh, it was actually his kindergarten teacher that told us that he might be autistic. Because she noticed when it was playtime, all the kids would play together, and Zachary would go and just sit by himself and just play with a toy all by himself. And it wasn't that he purposely excluded himself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that the other kids shunned him. Mm -hmm. It was literally he didn't notice the other kids. He was in his own little world, and he was happy. He was okay there. He was happy there. So he didn't. We're social creatures. We require social interaction. Yeah. He was detached, and it didn't bother him at all. Um, he would just sit by himself. Um, you know, even today, mm -hmm. you know, there are times he'll disappear for hours at a time, and he's absolutely fine with that. Um, it's not that he hates anybody. It's not that he's fed up with the world, or he just—he's just fine there by himself. Um, and then you pick up the other things, the sensitivity. Uh, uh, one of the things I can say about your brother is um, there are particular kinds of foods when he was little. Um, I can't think of any right off the bat. Let's say like Rice Krispies cereal. He wouldn't eat Rice Krispies cereal because he would say it cuts his tongue. To Tighten him, senses. Tighten senses gives him false information. The, the pieces of Rice Krispies felt like shards of glass to him. And he thought they were cutting his tongue in his throat. So he wouldn't eat them. Um, you notice that he always has trouble even today combing his hair. We've got to get him a special brush. A super mm -hmm. soft brush. The bristles in a brush feel like spikes. Just raking. Yeah, through just needles. Head. Ripping up his scalp. That's why he hates yeah. brushing his hair. You and I know it's just a brush. Yeah. His senses pick it up differently. Um, you know, there's just different things he sees and hears, different frequencies. Um, when we would take walks down the road, he would have to wear earmuffs because I mentioned buses earlier. Yeah. If a bus or a truck came by, when well, even that they were honking their horn, it was the Just sound, the engine, and the, the, the engine and the sound of the tires. He felt like it was an elephant stampede, and he would freak out. Yeah. So, you know, those are things that come up that, you know, again, like I was saying, imagine you're trying to do your homework. It's a fluorescent light for everybody, but for you, it's a strobe light. Like, blink, 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 blink. Yeah. You know, so that's the kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you start figuring out that. Okay, it might be autistic. Um, they also have physical traits. Um, a lot of, uh, it's called hand flapping. Yeah. They'll do this. I don't know if it's just nerves or whatever. Maybe. They'll just do that. Um, Zachary was over there. Um, but he, he will sit on the floor. He used to sit on the floor and just rock back and forth. Hmm. Like that. And uh, again, I don't know if it's a nervous thing or whatever, or it's some kind of meditation to calm him. Uh, I'm not sure. But a lot of autistic kids do that. They rock back and forth. And uh, he doesn't do that so much now. Uh, a lot of these quirks he's grown out of. But it's kind of cool. Because for every quirk he's grown out of, wait a while, there'll be the new quirk. And then you just get used to that one. Like, I don't, I'm sure you notice. 
because um, you've grown up with it and it probably seems normal to you. But his, his latest quirk that he's done the few past few years is where he talks to the people that aren't there. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've seen him. Where we'll all just be sitting there eating dinner and you look over his head and he's going. Yeah. Like, who are you talking to? You know, I mean, he doesn't verbalize anything, but he moves his lips and you tell he's hearing something. Mm -hmm. um, I like to give him the benefit of the doubt. I like to think that somewhere else, like in Minnesota, there's an autistic kid going. And he's sitting here going. Like some kind of weird chat service almost. Yeah, some like uh, telepathic chat service, you know. <laughs> we, we're going to find out one day that, that autism is, is actually far beyond anything we can do. And it's this next evolution of the brain <clears throat> that they are actually far more superior than us. I mean, their memories are, in, are unbelievable. They, they, they recall. They, they can just spit out facts like you wouldn't believe. Ask your brother about the Civil War. Ask your brother about dinosaurs. Yeah, about, history. They, yes. And yeah, there's situations or, or, or uh, subjects he likes. Mm -hmm. Boom! He will tell you everything. He will tell you where the planets are and what the stars are. You know, he has every one of them memorized. It's amazing. Um, and yet, at the age of 25. For all this knowledge and all this genius, he will walk right out in the middle of the street with a truck coming. How do you not know that one? It's not in his world. Yeah. How do you not know that will squish you? Wait on the curb. And then it passes and then you go. He will be oblivious and walk right out in front of the truck. You know, so it's an amazing way his senses and his knowledge works. Yeah, but... Um, <laughs> so... And this is a bit of a stretch, um, mm -hmm. and you can probably guess where this segue is going. But all of this knowledge that Zachary specifically possesses, and almost the, I don't want to say mystical, but just extended capabilities that he has, um, along with some of the gestures that he used to do early in his life, like the rocking or whatever, mm -hmm. much similar to how people in prayer do at the wall. And I've told you about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to catch on film this theory about... I developed a theory. I used to do um, uh, speaking engagements mm -hmm. for autism awareness. So I, I would <laughs> tour around uh, um, different, different cities in the nation. And I would speak on behalf of autism awareness. So I had my whole little presentation that I would do and tell my stories about being, you know, a parent of an autistic child. And again, this was in the 90s and the early 2000s when people didn't know what was going on. So uh, I just shared my experiences and some of my theories. And I, I did put out the theory for fun. What if they're not the ones who are messed up. What if we're the ones who are messed up because we're going to become outdated? What if autism, because the majority of problems with, again, not the severe autism, that yes. there's a lot of problems with those people and they need special care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're 35 years old and you still haven't been able to speak, uh, when you have fits of rage, uncontrollable rage where you hurt people um, because you can't control things. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a different painful level. But for the majority of people in the autism spectrum, what is their curve of what we're going to become? They're far smarter than we are. Their senses are far more enhanced than we are. Um, their knowledge is far greater than ours. They have freakish things that they can do. There are autistic kids who can't do the majority of things we do, but then sit down at a piano and have never played and could do Mozart. You know, they're called idiot savants, they used to be. Um, but, you know, they can just play the piano. There are some that, could, that just understand how to do surgery. One of the most complex things. Yeah, how that... do you know how to do that? They just know. There are ones that figure out mathematic theorems that college professors can't figure out. They just know. I call it superior to us. Yeah. Um, their problem is they don't fit into the society we currently have. They don't pick up on, on things. The, 
and again, they have so many distractions, the noises and whatever. A, a society run by autistic people would never have fluorescent lights. There's another way to do this. Don't, don't do fluorescent lights. You know, you wouldn't have this and that and the other thing. But we're currently in, in charge and control. Yeah. So we build things the way we like it. Um, so I, I threw out this, this theory of that they're the next evolution, hoping that people would see, see it from a different angle so that autistic people would be more acceptable. Right now, everything is like they're, they're cursed voodoo people. Yes. If I, I thought if I pitched the idea that they're the next evolution, and then maybe there's something wrong with us, or we're behind the curveball, then maybe we need to catch up and understand that. And I think that's the key to everything. Mm -hmm. you know, I've never been for uh, curing autism. I've been for autism awareness. If we can get everybody else to understand autism, then autism's fine. Yeah. You know, just like any discrepancy in society. If you can understand the other person, then you work it out. You know, there's room for everybody. And um, my, in, in my seminars that I did, and you brought it up, <clears throat> to show that it's a matter of perspective, I showed a, a video footage of autistic children various autistic children rocking back and forth in, in the, the quirk that they have, yeah. you know, in, in the routine that they do, rocking back and forth. And I said, that looks pretty weird, doesn't it? That's strange. If you walk in the middle room, you walk in a room, your kid's sitting in the middle room just rocking back and forth, there's something wrong there. And then I clicked on another video clip, and it was of people at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And what did they do before the Wailing Wall? They, they say their prayers. Thing and they bob up and down in front of the Wailing Wall. I showed a, a Tibetan monks in prayer, all sitting in rows in prayer, just like autistic kids, rocking back and forth. And I was like, they do it because of spirituality. It's acceptable. Yeah. That's not strange. Those are Tibetan monks meditating, praying, Becoming better people. You're 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 bobbing up and down, bowing before the wailing wall to connect with your God. To 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 pray to become a better person and wish for a better world. How is that okay? We don't know why they're doing that. Mm -hmm. So why judge? Are they hurting anybody? Maybe that's their meditation. Maybe that's their prayer. And I just found that really enlightening. And when I, whenever I would do that in the seminar, that part of the seminar, you could just see the audience, the light bulb go on. Yeah. Like, you know. So um, I, I, I like to believe, uh, in many aspects, autistic people have jumped ahead. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if in the next 50 years we find out, oh, they knew all along. We just weren't clued in. Yeah. Uh, just currently now, they just don't fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, maybe, you know, and, and poor kids like Zachary would have been the pioneers. That, yeah, I did this one, no one knew what was going on. Now everyone understands, so I'm not so weird. You know, but uh, I like to push that theory out there that wouldn't that be cool if they're the next step? Mm -hmm. They just jumped it 50 years before they should have. So they don't fit in now, but they'll get time when we always go, man, wish I was autistic. I don't understand any of this. You know? So, um, you don't know. But Zachary is talking to someone. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. His senses are more enhanced than mine. His brain can calculate and do things I can't. Who am I to say? What are you, who are you talking to? Just because I can't hear him, just because I can't, doesn't mean he can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. There's somebody in Minnesota going, right you are, Zach. Yeah, and you're right. We don't really know because we've never really studied it. I had a specialist <laughs> scribble in his notebook when I made up a story about Zachary levitating. That's how much we know. <laughs> I do it! Levitation! Ha! Unfortunately, this interview is cut off due to outside forces. However, 
just from what I have, a whole new eye-opening experience on autism has been revealed to me and to hopefully all of you. The way my father demonstrates this interpretation of autism is almost evolutionary, celestial maybe even, and the, but, and the connections that he made to many activities in other cultures, whether it be recorded or not, are revolutionary. How can an autistic child bobbing and rocking in the middle of their kitchen be considered so alien and so strange, yet monks in a Tibetan temple or people praying to the Wailing Wall are considered intriguing and simply spiritual when doing the same actions? We do not understand what autism is, and unfortunately, the human nature of the matter is that we hate and fear what we do not understand. But what he said that was also very interesting was the fact that people do not know how to communicate with these inv individuals and cannot seem to grasp their mechanical nature. It's like a computer in some regards. It can only do what it's told, and it can only enact those orders if the instructions are given to them in the quote-unquote language that they use and understand. For a portion of sick humor, it is a shame that the analogy cannot provide more understanding to these people, yet we as a society continue to progress into a technological world. However, I believe that it is now time to up the ante. It is not only empowering and enlightening to see an active expert in the autism field and an advocate for autism awareness let his knowledge flow on the subject, but it still can never compare to seeing someone who lives and manages the diagnosis in their day-to-day -day life. That is why I turn now to my brother, Zachary, the one mentioned in my, the, my previous interview, and indeed a child diagnosed with autism at the age of four, during the peak of rapid autism cases being made in the early 1990s. Let's watch and see how much different it is when looking deeper into the world of autism from one who walks with it every day. Okay. So just from your standpoint, as someone who we've already established has autism, how do you, how do you view it? Like, what do you think it is? Um, mo most people call it a disability, but I, I just think it, it's a, um, I think it's like something that's just a uh, widely misunderstood. It's more of a, uh, a completely unique way of how maybe the brain functions. Mm -hmm. It's just, its origins are, I don't want to say obscure, but mysterious. Oh, it certainly is. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of different theories about why autism is what it is and how it came to be. Um, and one of the theories is definitely an evolutionary kind of um, construct. So... Oh, yeah. There, there has been theory, some theories about that, some of the more, and, and you're going to find there's going to be more mm -hmm. uh, possible and acceptable theories than some of the the unacceptable, for lack of a better term. Well, I mean, there's a wide spectrum of theories to come up with, especially since the research for it and, you know, the definite answers are so fogged up and gray that, you know, it's, it's hard to decipher. Oh, yeah, because... Like you said, some yeah, some people say that it is a a, di a new uh, strain of evolution, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm not talking like a, like an X Men thing, but like, no, 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 no. but um, but they, but I I I guess it could be like a new uh theory of of evolution, whether it's just simply uh a new electrical um. I guess for I don't want to say format, but yeah. uh, characterization of the brain. Um, there could be even a genetic factor that could be involved. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, of of different theories that we have yet to discover and understand about in order to truly understand what autism really is. Mm -hmm. But but I think that's why. Uh, underneath it all, autism is deemed as a very interesting subject for um, whether you be a doctor or a, phys uh, a physicist. Um, 
psychologist. Yeah, psychologist or anything geneticist, anything like that. Yeah. To uncover what is the true or what could be factoring in uh, autism, whether it's its creations or what makes them do the things they do. Mm -hmm. um, Personality-wise, how they react in their environment, uh, how they do things socially, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Especially since it's a very fluctuating kind of diagnosis. And over the years, the tarp that's kind of been thrown over the autism spectrum has drastically increased. Um, especially in the 90s towards like a cutoff date in 2007, which is when it definitely exploded and widened. Um, so, even then, much like how every person is individualized, every person with autism is so much different from case to case. Oh yeah, in fact, uh, it, autism is it's just a broad term. Um, it, it kind of came out like a catch-all for like anyone who, uh, who thinks and behaves differently and, and appears socially withdrawn. Um, mm -hmm. they, they now call the term, call it, uh, autism spectrum disorder. Yes. Because there's, there's different forms of it. Um, mm -hmm. like Asperger's the, and such like that. Oh yeah. That. yeah. Well that, that's like the, uh, the, the lesser extent. Asperger's is like, it's so far less. I mean, there's still some a little bit different about them, but they're like so far on the other. It's such a high level. functioning classification. Yeah, they're, they they can still be a little quirky mm -hmm. in personality wise and some of the stuff they do, but it's not enough to be make them adapt in some of the stuff mm -hmm. they do. Whereas if you're on the severe end, um, I wouldn't know the name of that other than just severely I, autistic. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Um, Th those people actually, um, they could be almost, they want to know how to speak uh, correctly, they, they probably don't think clearly, and they are, they probably would not be good to handle stuff themselves. Um, they would need assistance, and they are definitely I'll, deficient in some Oh areas. yeah, a lot of, a lot of assistance. Mm -hmm. Like with me, I'm being all just first myself. Yes. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm more like, more in the middle, but I, I can't tell you exactly what my exact designation is. Yeah. Um, especially from what I know, I mean, from just the stories that our family's told or whatever, do you think that the diagnosis for autism can be manipulated or perhaps improved upon with intensive care? Because I know that there are just horror stories um, where autistic children don't get the support that they need, so they remain at a lower functioning efficiency than someone like you who's had a lot of care and work and assistance in dealing with autism uh, to kind of exercise yourself up to a certain better standard. I think there's... There's multiple fact, multiple factors that can fall under it. Um, I mean, aside from like trying to understand, uh, trying to figure out how this person became autistic in the first place, how they became diagnosed with it, uh, and whatever, I would say the biggest factor that would lay in that situation would be societal environmental. Because, like in my case. If you had a good, understanding family that would help you out along the way, even though you might encounter bumps in the road like everyone else does. life, yeah. Yeah. And you, you have like a pretty good environment, you would be pre, pretty much okay. Mm -hmm. And you, you always have somebody to lean on. Whereas, if you look on the other side of the coin, if you have a, uh, put simply, a dysfunctional uh, setting, chances are that autistic person, no matter what on the spectrum, is going to have it very rough. They won't be able to mature like how someone who is more fortunate would be. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, because yeah, like in my case, even though I've been wrestling, not wrestle, but trying to... Struggling with. Yeah, trying to work with my autism and in combat, like all of its 
a negativity, I, I still tr I still do very good. I I have, I have a good loving family. Uh, I I have a lot of good hobbies to kind of like lose myself and to calm myself. Mm -hmm. um, I even have have a certain religion that that I like I always look uh, look upon. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's like a lot of, a lot of stuff with, with me personally that that I can point out that it's like an example of how even some people with autism could get get on life um, fairly good. Um, and, and like I said, um, it, it just kind of all comes down to uh, or the societal and environmental aspects. That's how you can ensure um, somebody with autism, Asperger's, mm -hmm. whatever uh, they are on the spectrum, that is how you can ensure uh, they will have good self-esteem, they feel, at least they have like some self-worth, and, and, and at the very least, the autistic person themselves can believe that they can try to move forward. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of the pinnacle for almost any sort of mental deficiency. Whether it be bipolar syndrome, depression, schizophrenia. Yeah, that syndrome. Yeah. Like, a lot of it is about the person's mental and emotional standing by themselves. Once that person feels that they can stand up and fight for moving forward in life, then other people tend to rally around them. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, look at your story. It's incredible. Um, especially being in the height of like the first major wave of rapid autism case increase. Um, and when research was just being just majorly cranked out in order to figure out what's going on. Um, and living in Florida, which was an interesting place for someone dealing with autism in its own right, yes? Well, an interesting place for an interesting boy is all I can say about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but, but like, uh, in my case, where how autism have influenced me a bit. I was I was born in 1993 during mm -hmm. the fourth in the 90s was seen as the decade of the forefront of the autism research bit. Because mm -hmm. beforehand, you may have heard of it, but people definitely did not understand you. And they were the cases were a lot rarer because it was a lot more uh, funneled from diagnosis qualifications. Right. And, the, and especially the culture back then was a lot less curious and a lot more apprehensive. Yeah. About I, mean, I don't want to say that back then it was more conservative, but because of the less understanding and the theories they had back then on what autism is or how it's even brought out. Yeah. Or is just is widely untrue. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, like, in most recently, or even, like, going back when I was first born in the 90s, uh, I'm sure you're aware of, like, the whole vaccination controversy thing. Yes, that is one of the theories. Yeah, they, there was a point in time where they believed that vaccinations were the cause of autism. But then after, um, a few scientific studies that came out, where there was very little correlation between autism and vaccinations, some people just decide to drop it. I mean, there was... And, I mean, coming from someone who does not suffer from those things, um, I can understand why, um, whatever purpose that they're trying to fulfill in making these theories, but the proof, yes, we do know that there is little correlation between the two, but there is still that aching suspicion. And that's why it's a major theory still to this day. Maybe not so prominent as it was in the first wave of the 90s 
and early 2000s. Right. But it still, it still can be found. Um, so it really depends on... Right, and, and the thing like what the... If, if there's still people that still believe in uh, the vaccination conspiracy or whatever uh, they might believe in, I, I just call that the bottom line. That just boils down to ignorance, which, uh, can, uh, which can come down to everything. I mean, what proof do you have if, if you receive like a couple shots for uh, tetanus, Hold on, pronounce that right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or uh, the, or some kind of new, new flu mutation that may be going around. What proof do you have if the vaccinations you receive as a newborn baby or at least that the very least one or two gave you or gave the child uh, this disability, which is mm -hmm. uh, still. Uh, widely searched about, no one uh, hardly knows about. Kind of, so, seems, kind of seems to me like you're, you're kind of jumping to, to uh, wrongful conclusions. My so, I obviously see the standpoint that you have on the vaccination theory. Um, you could play devil's advocate and say there's equally not enough proof to say that it isn't a possibility. Um, but we can kind of rest assured that you can believe what right. you should well, believe, yes. Yeah, I, I know, because I, I would sound like a hypocrite myself by like, going too far to that side, because I'm not a doctor, I'm not yeah. a physicist, so I can't pull up those numbers from the top of my head, yeah. but at the same time, I can pretty much assure you, and I'm sure if you were to talk with any of my folks, my family, um, I would, I can pretty much, uh, I can pretty much bet that they're going to be on, on the disagreement on the I can imagine. Vaccination um, especially since there are two factors. Um, as we know, it's typically believed to be much like anything else, some kind of chemical imbalance or perhaps even an issue dealing with the chromosomes in the brain. But the two pieces of evidence that, I, that are interesting to me is you can actually physically recognize if a child has severe traits for autism um, when at least at six months old. So, if they don't have those kind of blockages, and it suddenly manifests, you know, come to that two-year lifespan, um, it might have something to do with the body reacting to what's being put into it, but it equally could be a lot of other things. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Like, like I said, we can go back to, like, the societal environmental factors. Um, mm -hmm. Well, like with me, um, I'm sure even like as a little baby, I, I appeared or, or acted a little quirky because one of the major things with autism is they always have um, they always have a particular pattern that uh, suits them to help them quell some kind of anxiety or yes. something or or sometimes that they see. sees like a special cue. Um, for, for example, like when I was young, I always paid attention to the clock, and if it's like exactly, say, not uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, as most kids are usually up by that point. We can hope. Yeah. Um, I always know that one of my favorite shows, Blue Squeeze, is always on. Mm -hmm. So at 10 o'clock, even as I'm eating breakfast, I always go in front of the TV and uh, watch Blue's Blues, and yet it's always, it's always on. Now, let's switch to the other side. Oh, uh, because obviously TV shows don't last forever. I will say, because of my autism, when that show got canceled and when it hit that 10 o'clock mark, 
it was very upsetting to me because it didn't fit with my pattern. Loose it, goose wasn't supposed to come off. Um, and, and that goes with all the other shows I used to watch when I was a kid, uh, depending on the times and whatever. But um, so I, honestly, when my dad learned about, because I was diagnosed with a with autism spectrum sore when I was at the age of four. Um, my dad became very smart. Um, during, the, during the age before we had TiVo and DVR and all those recording stuff, he would record certain reruns of the show on VHS. So whenever, um, so whenever that time comes, or if I'm bored or whatever, I can just pop in. He can just pop, pop on the tape, and I uh, just enjoy my shows right regularly. And that my anxieties will be, will be pretty much uh, done. You know, for the time for the time being. Hmm. So that that's just uh, one example. Um, yeah, I'm sure that there's many that could be thought of. Um, certainly throughout the years, growing up, whatever. Um, but you were kind of talking about like your daily life and whatever. Um, of course, as a child until now with autism, whatever. Um, so how would you say that you operate on like a, just a normal schedule with autism? Uh, I, I will tell you because of my autism, I tend to see things as a little bit ritualistic and anything that, will, that comes up out of the ordinary from, from my personal schedule, if you want to look at that way. Yeah. Um, it can be a little jarring at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, base, and basically because of like, of like my quirkiness, I, um, I tend not to do well with change so much. And because of life, that can be very difficult for me. Um, like for most of my life, and we'll just kind of fast, uh, fast forward to a time like, say, high school. Yeah. Um, high, high school was very, um, it, it, it was a good time for me for a couple of reasons. Because um, before, my, during my earlier days of school, elementary and junior high, I didn't have any friends because people mm -hmm. didn't understood me. Um, and because... I, I had trouble reading people, which is one of the major factors with autism. Sociability with other people was very challenging. High school was the first time where I became social with, with people. Uh, now, after my senior senior year in high school, um, I will I will say when new things started coming abroad, like entering college for the first time. Well, technically, even now, sometimes when uh, entering a new job, those anxieties can be pretty tough. Um, I even remember uh, a couple points in time where I get used to get very bad panic attacks. Mm -hmm. um, I get very bad, sore, bad shakings. My heartbeat uh, gets uh, really, really hard. My throat clenches. There's even points where I even get violently ill at some points. Um, but that, but that's, um, those are the tough points that sometimes I have to deal with with, all, with my autism. Um, one of the ways I, com I combat, uh, I guess you can say, autistic induced anxieties because some things don't fit with, mm -hmm. with my daily routines or whatever, I've uh, developed many different methods. Um, I, I try listening to certain types of music, big eight, big uh, classic rock and 80s fans, so that yeah. calms me down. Um, if I get bored of that, I even listen to world music. Mm -hmm. I, I especially like the Celtic and uh, Asian music a lot. Um, 
I even tried like different other methods of of trying to give me a peace of mind and ease my spiritual stress. Um, sometimes I use these special spirit rocks uh, that that are supposed to like calm anxiety and stress and all that. But the biggest thing I've I've actually tried to do, I just I just simply play, uh, pray to Jesus. Jesus and God. Hopefully they they can cure they can help low quell my anxieties down because mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, not to get too much on like on the biblical side of stuff, but when a person like uh a Jesus hang out with, with someone with uh autism or some dis intellectual disability like that, somebody who's uh hardly understood by the general public. He could be uh, some somebody to lean on, mm -hmm. but now that's also not to say like with the material world at least. I have a kind, loving, understanding father, and a and a mother that that work me out whenever I can. Those are also the people that I uh, that I lean on to the most whenever I have troubles. I can imagine, especially since they were there since, well, since you were born, so they've had all the time in the world to kind of really immerse themselves into this new world that you both have walked through together. Right. Now, now I will say, as much of the challenges that I've overcome, despite my autism, honestly, graduating with high school, uh, honors, I graduated college on Dean's List, believe it or not. And um, I, I even landed out like two jobs in the course of like two, sort of in the course of two years. Uh, I worked in a movie theater where there's like a lot of social interaction. Especially. I yeah, I did that already. Um, so yeah, despite all that, um, there's some stuff that I've overcome over the years uh, that, I've, that I did. Uh, very well. Again, back to the social stuff. The only, the only, I will say, the only problem that I had trouble with is like, um, like going back to high school. Throughout my high school years, I never actually dated one with anybody once. And, and it's not that um, I have anything against people or anything like that, but in that kind of game. It's kind of like a two-way street. I can't understand them because I'm not good at reading people or understanding what they do. And because of my quirky aspects and, and what I am, they don't understand me. So, As that aspect is yeah. Especially since they're just as chemically wound up and trying to deal with their own lives and of themselves. <laughs> so, you yeah. know. Yeah. Welcome to puberty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you've mentioned a lot of the different issues that you've kind of gone through, um, but equally a lot of the, um, accolades that you've kind of mentioned, the things that you've overcome. Um, so there has been research, or at least an attempt to conduct this research, about ways not only to understand autism, but to potentially cure it. So... Are you are you comfortable where you are now in life? Are you at peace or even enjoying being in an autistic world? Or do you ever really think sometimes that you want it to go away? That you want to be cured of it? Well, here's something very shocking and interesting. Because my viewpoints changed over years. Mm -hmm. For a long time, because, um, well, like just from perspective, when I was in grade school and when I was starting to learn to figure out for myself that I had some, I want to say something wrong with me, but something different about me, I remember asking my dad about what autism is. And because this was during the time when people were starting to learn about it for the first time, he tried to understand explain the best I can, and I just basically asked him, is that why I'm very different? And 
it kind of gave him a shock because he knew that I knew that and I figured out what my own thing was. Um, and because of like, you know, the sociability aspect and me, me trying to cope with, with like, I don't want to say societal norms, but like how things work, it, it was it was very challenging and it, it was overwhelming. And there was actually a time where I thought my autism was a curse and I kind of wanted to be gone. But after, again, I turned back to my father and, and the like, it's not all that bad. I'm just born that way. And I can overcome it. I can overcome it at my own pace, and it can even come to me in, in the best advantages. Um, so I don't have to look autism in a bad way. And through the gain of like self-confidence and and then and towards my high school days where I started getting more friends than ever, and even still, because I haven't told everyone them about what I have, but they still think I'm cool nonetheless, I started to turn down that autism is, my, autism with me is a, is a big blessing. I don't know why I have it. I don't know why I was born with it. Even I don't understand some of the stuff that I do half the time. Mm -hmm. And yet, who does? I don't mind having autism anymore, and I don't look at it the wrong, at the wrong way. Um, and so now, getting back into your question about. This whole, uh, the whole idea of curing autism and such, I disagree with, with it, uh, with having a cure for autism, because uh, not to like uh, misquote uh, Jeff Goldblum's character dress part. You're so you're so concerned about thinking that you can do it, you didn't stop to think should you do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the same is true for with autism. First off, autism is not a disease. You can't, you can't get, uh, it's, it's not contagious. Yeah. yeah, it's not contagious. You, you won't get it just by shaking someone's hand. Um, it, it's not something like a horrible genetic mutation that requires operation or anything like that. Um, Autism is not a bad thing. So, if, 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 like, if your child in the future is diagnosed with autism, the main thing you have to do is just learn from, your ch from the child, understand some of the stuff they do, and overall just have patience, because they learn in their own pace, despite being very analytical, detail-oriented, and things like in very extraordinary ways. Because um, if you outright cure it, um, you're, you're kind of like destroying who that person really is. Like if I'm cured, I would not be the person that you'd be talking to uh, in this table right now. Mm -hmm. Without autism, who's to say that I would be um, I'd be a a rambunctious crazy person or who's to say that I wouldn't be a jerk and a bully everyone that I meet mm -hmm. um, what you see here and with what I have I, I am I'm a very peaceful person and, and I don't have I, I'm, not, I'm not a prejudiced person I, I don't I understand people might have flaws and such, but that doesn't that doesn't bother me. Um, Especially since you know what it's like being on the opposite end when everyone just not to make it so blanket and gloom and doom, but out to get you. Oh well, yeah. Well, and here's the thing: I've been bullied for years, either some subtly or other otherwise blatantly. Um. Of having autism, I don't bully anyone. That, I don't bully anyone else. I wouldn't even think of trying to do that because that's a critical on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
uh, just because you've been mistreated for what you are and how you do stuff, that doesn't make any sense to me that since you are that way, you turn around and do it to someone else. Yeah, you I mean, can I understand there's like that, that, that certain power struggle or feeling confident in yourself and such, but to me, that just doesn't make any sense. That doesn't... It's more the empathetic side because you know what that pain is like. So you don't want to give that to, to other people. So with everything that you've gone over with in all that regard, and especially the confidence that you have for not wanting to be cured, wanting to be who you are and staying proud with it, how do you think autism is going to affect the rest of your life down the road? I will say the two biggest worries I have with autism, the social aspects, Hopefully that will get my first date and know what it's like uh, uh, to be in love and and to have have someone even more that you can lean on to. And I'm not talking like just a friend, but like uh, eventually having a girlfriend and experiencing what that's like. Because, um, like I said, the problem with autism is that they can have problems with sociability. And if they don't understand you and you can't understand them, that's going to pose as, as a challenge. But I can always either ask my family members for help or I can even like try to figure out different ways to try to, I don't want to say outsmart my autism, mm -hmm. but like figure out ways to cope with it and work around it to make sure that I don't appear, <laughs> don't appear too quirky or too whatever that will um, um, uh, drive someone away. And forgive me if I sound a little bit like a broken record repeating everything I said. No, um, and in fact that helps because the point of this interview, not only to get your views and your opinions, I also want the people who are going to watch this to see how um, someone with autism operates. So everything that you're doing is exactly what I want because you get to show people what the truth is. Right. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm very happy to hope, hope do that. And I, I do hope that just by, by our talk and what I'm able, what, uh, what I'm able to shed on autism and what I have and how they are kind of influence my life and such, I, I hope people have a better understanding of it. Um, just get back to your previous question, the mm -hmm. other thing that I hope in the future is is a bit of a career, because knowing in today's world it's getting a little harder with the economy and such, and one of the things I'm trying to, um, I guess, push myself with and try to mess around with is is a little bit of initiative because auti autistic people tend to follow their own own schedules because they're having like certain rituals themselves i just i just have to learn to try to give a good kickstart to finally uh, figure out what i'm what i'm exactly good at and not look too much like in the pros and cons of some of the careers I'm trying to look at. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm a very, very intellectual person. There was that one, one point in time where I like to do something like a teaching job. Uh, but knowing, knowing today's world, how, how it can be a little bit tougher um, with the sociability aspects and learning like every, what every other single person or me in a classroom is like, um, that that might that might be a little bit too challenging for me, but that's not to say um, that that's the end of the road for me. There's going to be different possibil different possibilities that may be out there, um, and of course there's also like a like different um, business and probably even government agencies that might help people out with disabilities and such, that might give me an advantage, a certain, uh, a helpful push in life, if you will. Yeah. Wow. That was very insightful, and 
very enlightening. Um, it kind of puts a little flutter in my heart to see your pride and your strength. Um, so. I was going to say, well, it's funny that you brought this up. Mm -hmm. um, I, not to sound like too embarrassing or whatever, but um, I did, it was funny, I had a dream one time. Um, I want to say it was like, when I was like in high school or college or something, I had a dream where I was like, like a young adult, like, uh, like my thirties. Um, I just remember in the dream waking up early in the morning, get my breakfast and such, turning on on the TV. Um, I didn't get to see the whole thing of what was on TV, but it appeared to be like some kind of <laughs> a documentary on autism and different. Uh, learning disabilities and the like, and I just remember the dream that I just saw in the very end of it, and whoever was like the narrator or whatever said something along the lines of uh, autism and the like are very, are very interesting and they're wonderful uh, qualities that the kids of the kids of of future generations are experiencing, and like when the end credits come up, it played, it played like that, huh? Like that typical, I guess Disney esque kind of happy, happy music. Yeah. Go along with it, and I just remember the dream, smiling, rolling the credits, knowing that finally, uh, in the future, people have a better understanding of, mm -hmm. of people diagnosed with this, and. No, they they will no longer go through any kind of abuse or uh, misunderstandings and uh, neglect, uh, shunning, yeah, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's certainly a future that I wish for everyone. Yeah, um, I do hope we get to see that. Yeah, especially knowing some of my other friends who suffered from this too, um, who deal with a lot worse circumstances than you have. So thank you for the best. Believe me, I do too. Thank you very much for the interview. Oh, um, no problem. How fascinating. So many new answers came to light and to see how a high functioning autistic person operates even in a controlled environment like an interview is enough to open people's eyes as to how they really live and exist around us. But even then, there are so many unanswered questions and theories that have yet to be properly proven. Some might be easier to eliminate, but the evidence is all not clear enough to make those judgments. Zachary's dream overall is most impactful to me. No matter where, no matter when, we can all hope that we can grow to understand these people and give them the care that they need. As this documentary comes to a close, there are still questions that even you can give yourself. With what little we know now, what do you believe is the truth about autism? And what, and what can you do to help them? Thank you very much for joining me today, and continue to study this. Griffin Hall, signing off.